Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I welcome a guest who I absolutely adore. Why, you may ask? Well, let me give it to you straight. It's because of her hustle. She has been hustling since day one, which got me thinking about hustling. If at any point in your life you have played a competitive sport with a coach or simply had a parent that wanted you to hurry the hell up, then you know what hustle means. But in business, what is hustling, why is it important, and why should an entrepreneur care? First, the definition of a hustler is a force, someone, to move hurriedly or unceremoniously to a specific direction. But that's not really the hustle I'm talking about. Nor am I talking about the pool shark version of hustle where I pretend to be very bad at pool, but after a few drinks, voila, the bank shots are open. Okay, I've digressed. I want to talk about the informal meaning, the slang meaning of hustler, to proceed or work rapidly or energetically, to strive headstrong and voraciously, which means to be excessively eager towards a goal. Most successful entrepreneurs do not wait for opportunities to fall in their lap. Bezos went from working in a garage to being able to provide an item for any garage in the world. A famous quote by Milton Burley, if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. In my belief, a hustler is the opposite of someone that doesn't give their 100%. According to Ross Simmons, unconsciously these people don't put in 100% because if they fail, their talent can be questioned. However, by putting in 80% and failing, they can look at those around them and say, if I would have worked harder, I would have succeeded. That is not the mentality of a hustler. A hustler takes personal responsibility for failure more often than they will take responsibility for success. A hustler puts in the blood, sweat, and tears with one intent, success. They do not see failure as an option, and they will do what they can to achieve their goal. This determination is the driving factor behind their obsession with working hard. A hustler strives to perfect their craft daily and doesn't flinch when someone tells them their idea is crazy. How can you become a hustler? It all starts with the individual. And here are 10 ways to help. Number one, network to create opportunities. I cannot stress networking enough. Number two, stay focused and eliminate distractions. Sorry, PS5. Better luck next time. Number three, be genuine about helping others. This is very, very important. Number four, Dream ridiculously big dreams. I mean huge dreams because it will lead to number five. Take risk. Be okay with taking risk, but also take manageable risk. Number six, fail hard and often. Now, admittedly, I say I've never failed a day in my life. I either succeed or I learn. But number seven, never quit. There are going to be some lonely days. But as I've said before, the sweet isn't as sweet without the bitter. Number eight, thinking outside the box. A good quote for this comes from former guest Colin Landforce who said, and I quote, a huge unlock for me in business was realizing that not all innovation comes in the form of crazy new technology, tools, animation, etc. Something as subtle as a floor plan can change the game. Number nine, value self-improvement. Read, meditate, drink water. And lastly, number 10, love what you do and embrace your authenticity. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with the owner of Brow Betty. Man, you do not understand how many times I said this, Jackie. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited about this. We've already been talking. We're having a great time. So first, let's introduce the world to Jackie Mans. Okay. Go ahead and give the world a little background. Who is Jackie? Wow, that's a deep question. That is deep. <laughs> Jackie just turned 50. So that's she's, what I'm talking Happy she's birthday. To- thank you. She's completely um, in touch with who she is right now. Doesn't look a day over 21, guys. I'm going to oh, be honest God with you. God bless you. You're already my favorite. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say there. So let's let's talk about let's talk about brow, which is the hair, the, the eyebrows. Yes. Right? So yes. I just want to get folks uh, familiar with it. Yep. Um, let's kind of explain what the business is. Okay. So basically, we are a waxing salon. Uh, We specialize in eyebrows and full body waxing. Um, We started in 2008. It was a concept that came out of my head because I have very unruly brows (laughs) and lots of stories behind it, but I needed somewhere to go. And there was nowhere in Portland at the time to really go to get your brows done. I didn't have all day. I had small kids. I had things to do. I didn't want to go to a sla- or a, a regular spa where mm-hmm. you go and you lay down and you take hours at a time. Um, so we created the concept and brought it to Portland. And you know, it's kind of funny. I feel like recently I've been seeing, you know, this, the brow industry really taken off. Oh, it's everywhere now. I mean, 13 years ago, which is when we started, there was nothing. I mean, basically yeah. we had Benefit Brow Bar, which is a huge company out of San Francisco. And they specialize in cosmetics. Okay. Um, and so at the time when we opened here in Portland, there was none. There was nothing else. And even that benefit was in the malls. And I don't know about you. You probably don't experience this, but no female wants their lip waxed in a mall <laughs> in I, front of other people. Okay. I, I must admit, <laughs> I, I, when I walk like through Washington Square yes. Mall and I see those, I'm like I'm grabbing my latte from Starbucks. I'm like. <laughs> What the heck is going on over here? Is this, yep. the, is this lady's face bleeding? Exactly, right? What's <laughs> happening over there? Yeah, so that was, I I never did that. I was like, I am not doing that. No. I, I get it. So so go through the process. How, how did you kind of start the company? Well, it's interesting. Um, let's go back a little bit. My husband and I lived in L.A. for a while, and I my background is service industry. So I worked for Four Seasons Hotels. Um, I was in their sales group. And when I first joined there, it was completely different than, you know, kind of the Oregon um, state of mind. They wore power suits and they were all dolled up and they didn't drive, you know, Forerunners and Pathfinders. They drove BMWs and that's just who you were as a sales girl working at Four Seasons. So I had to jump right in. (laughs) So one time they said, okay, we're going to get our brows done at Anastasia. And this was, I mean, I'm 27, 28 years old. So this is in the late 90s. And I'm like, okay. I mean, everybody knew Anastasia. <laughs> she did Oprah Winfrey's brows. It was a big deal. I personally had never even gotten my brows done before. So on my first you know, lunch break, we go, we walk over to Anastasia. I was fascinated by it. Here's this woman who's like the guru to the stars of eyebrows. She's behind a huge wall. She's $75 to get your brows done with her. Wow. And my girlfriends and I sat on our lunch break and I watched and she had about five other people working for her. And every 20 minutes you're like, next, next. And I'm just sitting there like, this is amazing. Like, this is like a cool concept. This yeah. is, this is smart. This is find a need and fill it. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I, I was back in the Donnie Deutsch days and I'd watch his show all the time. <laughs> and I was like, find a need and fill it. So anyways, that was never, I mean, obviously I was just working in a hotel at that point in time and getting my brows done. So fast forward many years later, um, my husband and I were in real estate. It was in 2007, right oh, before, yeah. you know. I, I was 2008. Yep. Oh, yeah. So 2007, we saw what was coming. We knew what the, you know, it's kind of funny. I tell people that all the time. It's like, if you're a realtor during that, or even in just the real estate industry. Yep. You knew what was coming. We knew it was coming. We knew it was coming. Heck yeah. That's why I left. We rode that wave. Yeah. I mean, that I was know. a huge wave to ride, and it was awesome. It was. And we were in it for a while. Um, and so literally, we went to, um, I took my, my husband and I went to L.A., back to L.A. for his birthday. We were living up here at the time. First thing we did, we checked into Four Seasons, because I still have friends working there. And the second thing I did was go get my brows done. <laughs> and I kid you not. And I came back. And my husband and I, for his birthday, I bought him tickets to go see David Beckham at the Galaxy game. I'm not sure if it was his birthday or my (laughs) birthday. (laughs) The truth comes out. Yep, I bought some tickets. 
<laughs> and the whole way down to the game in Carson, which was about an hour and a half, and yeah. the whole way back, we came up with Brow Betty. We knew yes. the real estate industry was changing. We knew that we wanted to move on with something else. We were doing you know, real estate at the time together. And I knew there was a need in Portland, in the suburbs, you know, kind of we're in the Lake Oswego, Tualatin area. Um, we need to, I needed somewhere to go. Yeah. And I proposed the whole plan to my husband whole way back. And he's like, I think we're onto something. So that was kind of, that was the start of Betty. That was, that was, it was taken from the concept that I sat in mm -hmm. eight years old earlier and, um, and found a need in Portland. You know, that's, that's such an important, valuable lesson. I think for the listeners at home is if you want to be a real good entrepreneur, find something that you personally need, mm -hmm. right? Like yep. a service that you're wanting that uh, an issue that hasn't been solved right and attack that issue if you 100%. can if you can solve that issue there's probably going to be a market for it yep right i yeah. mean a lot of these things that are created today are just really solving a problem exactly and i'm still to this day with all my employees and everyone i'm still my best consumer i'm still <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still the one jumping in a chair every month saying will you do my brows i mean i'm the, I'm the best judge at this point like okay it's still going i love it i still have a good concept so now is is this the first business you guys started um, yeah, well, no, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> I've been, you know, I think, let's see, the first business I ever ran was, um, really out of my sorority house. No. <laughs> <laughs> so if you went to U of O and you were an alpha fee, um, you'll remember these days, but I was fortunate enough where, um, I went to college, went to U of O and my parents were very into me being good, doing good studying and getting good grades which meant they would pay for it i did not have to work and they wanted me to concentrate i was a little bit of a wild child so i i got their i got their groove <laughs> and so i didn't work and a lot of my girlfriends worked you know in between classes yep. and this and that and so one day my girlfriend came to me and she said can i borrow 100 bucks i don't get my paycheck until next week blah 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 blah, blah. i'm like absolutely i said i'll give you 100 bucks today 110 next week so that was my first business. You, you turned into a loan shark. <laughs> <laughs> a college, a college totally. loan shark. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I told my daughter that story, and she just about lost Damn. it. She's like, no, you did not. Wow. I'm like, yes, I did. I did it for my sisters. I did it for, yeah. I had a little safe. I had Savage. a little ledger. Uh huh. I, I didn't like know it. what was going to happen if somebody didn't pay me back. <laughs> like, was I really going to take out their knees? Like... <laughs> So that's that some was Tanya really Harding stuff going totally, on. Totally. Yep. So that really was my first business. And I kind of saw the ins and outs of what, what, how I made business off of it. Everybody won, yeah, right? Like yeah. they got money before their paychecks came yeah. in. And so I could slow them until the next time. And, you know, I was in a position where I could do that. And then I was also making money, you know, and, but I'm a hustler too. I also was the kid in high school that worked three jobs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I, it wasn't about the job. It was about the money. It was just over like, oh my gosh holy cow, I can make a lot of tips. I mean, kind of what veered me into service industry is like you you just, you can hustle and you yeah. can keep going as far as you want in that field. So, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think I've mentioned this before, but, uh, you know, my entire high school career, I think I probably worked the right. entire time. Oh, I did. Uh, from the time I was 14 years old, of Dana Lee's daycare center. I was oh. my first job and it was awful. <laughs> but <laughs> they hired me because I was 14 years old. You know, I don't even know if you could at that time, but I think I had a worker's permit or something. Oh, yeah. And 14 was the youngest. Yeah. And, I mean, I was queen of Baskin-Robbins, Papa oh, Aldo's, nice. Newport Bay Company. Yeah, I had I love it. three jobs at one time. Yeah, and shout out to Kramer's Nursery for giving my first job picking berries and pulling See? plants. Like a 12 years old, baby. Yep. Yeah. And it's real young. Isn't it crazy? And I, I, I and it's sad because I, I, I hate to compare different generations and this and that, but it's like, I not only went to school, I was on, you know, tennis team, I was on, you know, sing song yeah. company, yeah. and I was doing three jobs. Yeah. You know, we just made it work. And yeah. now my kids can barely, like, I don't know where to get a job. I'm like, oh, don't <laughs> you start with me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm I'm not that mom. Yeah, I'm I like, remember working at, you know, it's actually no longer there, a small store called Lynn's Market Grocery Store. It's actually there in Mount Angel. Okay. I used to work two hours every morning, so I had a late start my senior year. So I would actually go to work from 7 a.m. until 9 a.m. Yep. And then I'd go to school, and then I'd go to baseball or basketball practice. Yep, yep, totally. And then once sports was over, okay, I'd go to school, and then I'd work after work. Yes, I worked after. So yep. I always had tennis till like 5, 30, 6 o'clock yep. at night, you know, whether we had tournaments or whatever we had. And, uh, yeah, and I always worked. I mean, basketball, I was there till 11. You know, Newport Bay, I was there. Yep, Derek, yes. Oh, man. 
the and burgers. And it was the best because, I, I, I mean, all the ice cream you could eat. Oh, Are you I, kidding me? I would always. So th- I know this is going to sound weird, so I'm sorry we're getting a little off track no, here. No, I told you. <laughs> it happens with me. <laughs> I used to love at Dairy Queen to wrap pickles in fries. Oh, I yum. don't know. I don't know. Don't don't hate me, people. Uh, that uh, was my thing. No, nope, I love pickle. Well, I drink pickle juice, so I'm a whole different breed of person. Yeah, that's a whole other <laughs> level. We're not even gonna go there. <laughs> so let's talk. Let's get back to the business okay, part. Okay. What <laughs> what would you say has been difficult about being an entrepreneur? Mm, you know, I always say, gosh, I don't even know. I always say I love ninety nine point nine percent of it. Mm. Love, 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 love it. Um, and not to throw my employees under the bus, but the hardest part is having employees. It just is. I adore them like my children. You know, I treat them not like my children, <laughs> like adults. Um, but you do. You become a parent, an accountant, yeah. a, you know, a dog walker. I mean, you name it. it yep. It's there's you, you're dealing with everybody and everything they bring to the table. And I always want to I always say family first. So I always want to treat them like family and understand when things come up. Yeah. Um, but it is 100% the hardest part of my business because I rely on my employees for um, all the things that they do. And they bring so much, obviously, to our table. And so I have to treat them like royalty. They're yeah. just It's very hard. It's hard to um, maneuver sometimes. Do, do you feel like that's maybe the hardest part of, of owning your own business? My, the business I own right now, yes, definitely. It, it just is. It's schedules. And, and you know, with this pandemic, yeah. oh, my gosh, like – I cannot ever, uh, they have a sniffle, like you, they can't come near the oh, shop, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, no, we are face to face with people. We're still in full, like mask, get, get, you know, masked up. Yeah. So, um, so we can't. And on, on one part of me, it's like, oh, you know, our clients, they're really taking the brunt of it. But on the other half, I've got women that need to work yeah. and need to make a living. Yeah. And it's very hard when they can't come in because of all the protocols, you know? I mean, yeah. I used to be like, you're sick, put on a mask, you're fine. You know, back in the good old days, yeah, right? Yeah. Just like my mom taught me, like, you're fine, get <laughs> to <laughs> school. But now I'm like, oh, my gosh, okay, no, you can't come in. And it t- it wavers a lot on me. It's It it, it plays heavy. It's It's been heavy the last couple of years. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things you mentioned, it sounds like you have a lot of female workers yes. at your location. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to give a, a, a quick moment of applause to all those individual females that are still working because I know how difficult it is, especially – the individual with with kids at home. Yeah, I have a kid at home. Yep. I know how difficult that is. Um, it we're all in together. We are. Uh, we're all yep. in together, and keep keep fighting. Yep, we're gonna get there. Yep. How did how did your business make it through the pandemic? You know, it was it was so weird for me because we have been open, you know, seven days a week for twelve years, and that is my machine. That is my grind. That is yeah. my. You know, even if you take a day off, you don't really take a day off because yeah. there's still emails, there's still texts, there's yep. still drama, you know, things happening. Um, and so for me, the hardest thing in the world was being told by someone else, you're shut down. Yeah. You may not work today and you may not work tomorrow. And you and that took me a few weeks to get used to. It was really, really difficult for me. Um, I can't sit still. So mm-hmm. when you're telling an entrepreneur, go sit on your hands for a few minutes, like, no, thank yeah. you. Um, but then once, uh, once we got going, I was all in. I mean, I caught up on novels. I <laughs> caught up on things that I learned to play piano. I mean, there were things happening, you know, I, I was like, wow, there's things you have to figure out what to do during the yeah, day yeah. when you're told you can't leave your home and you can't run a business. Yeah. So we were fortunate enough that we did get the, um, the PPP loans coming in. And so my staff all stayed on with us oh, perfect. and we paid them the entire time hard in a service industry because they weren't getting their tips, but we equaled out their tips as well. That was part of the, wow. the payout. Wow. Um, and the way that the, the, the way they did the loans to the majority, it had to go to employees. You didn't, we didn't have a choice that first round. Um, so to survive as business owners was very difficult yeah. because we could not pay ourselves like we were paying our employees. And then you had everybody else who decided not to go back. They were being paid by the state, and they were being paid a lot by the state, yeah. right, through the unemployment. So it was a real tricky time, and we were really nervous about it. But it, I really shifted gears, and, like, my goal was, like, let's get back open. Like, we, I was watching people fall right and left. I yeah. knew some of my competitors, because, like I said, we have a ton of competitors now. I knew which ones were gone and which ones were, like, we're just packing up our bags and leaving. Um, and I get that. I, w- I mean, not that we were close to doing that, but I could have done that at any point in time and just said, you know what, we're done. 
Um, so we did. And almost every single employee came back to us. We just lost two, uh, which is fine. We knew that was going to happen. Like, you've been paid the whole time to do nothing, and now you're not coming back. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. Party of one. I'm not bitter. <laughs> So we knew that was coming, though. That's the statistics. Uh, So we just slowly had to open up our, our, you know, open everything back up. We had to be real careful. There were so many rules and there were so many regulations and uh, so many just nonsensical things. You know, we're already a spa, you know, like a, a salon. We are so pristine and clean in there. I mean, we still have inspectors coming in to make sure that, you know, everything's in line. So we're not a typical place. But it, it was really discouraging walking into somewhere like Fred Meyer where, I mean, all bets are off. Nobody really cared. There wasn't the protocols we had to. And then here we are, this little tiny small business that we were basically told, like, you'll be shut down if you don't do all these things. I'm like, oh. So that was really hard for me to watch yeah. other businesses do whatever the heck they wanted because they were essential and we were not. So, therefore, nobody really cared. That's tough. That's tough. And, you know, that's that's another thing I think a lot of our small businesses here in you, you know, Oregon and even the country kind of uh, dealt with was just, and you know, this is my, my request to any government officials that might be listening. Yes. I don't care what your political alignment is, no. but what I do care about is black and white, making yeah. sure that the instructions are black and white. There can't be any gray areas to this because we are dealing with individuals, you know, livelihoods, right. you know, these, these are their lives, yeah. right? And Absolutely. You, you get paid to live kind of thing. And it's, it's important that when these, policies are made it's it's made with a very clear directive i agree because i think too often it's 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 you know a little gray yes did you ever felt during this especially during the pandemic mm-hmm. uh, a moment of self doubt absolutely i mean there was times when i was like how are we going to do this like yeah. i don't know what to do right now and the other thing for a lot of us that a lot of people are going through now i mean remember the big tp run like <laughs> Try and get supplies still to this day, try and get supplies. So there's nothing worse than I have a, you know, a system down of how we do our inventory and where we get it from and this and that. And I mean, pretty soon I am like the rubber glove finder, you know, like I am in my car going to every friggin' place in town trying to find rubber gloves for my girls because it is required of us to have rubber gloves in between every service. That is so much waste to me. I can't even see straight. Yeah, Washing yeah. your hands kind of does the same thing. We do deal with blood here and there. It's not usually happens. So we've actually had gloves for a long time, but we've never had a shortage of gloves. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay. So my my you know day today is gonna be driving around to every single place, paying twenty four dollars for a box of a hundred gloves that I used to pay six dollars for. Yeah. I mean it's unreal. And it's 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 this is a issue like you know the supply chain issues across the board you know i was just reading an article this morning in the new york times talking about just the shortage of truck drivers where even when we have supplies we just can't get them to people that's exactly and all the you know all the ships sitting all the ships sitting up in in la you know out in the coast in the pacific and and and, you know one thing i just also want to express to everybody again we're all in this together we are absolutely you don't the only one yes and you don't need to be build a tp out of toilet paper you you (laughs) you can maybe just grab one pack and leave the rest for some other please come on for the rest other of us? people like yep. to actually clean themselves yep so let's <laughs> so not hoard out there thank you yeah put your rubber gloves back okay yeah, you <laughs> sick of me. we're digressing so fast yes we are i'm sorry my fault 100 this is a great conversation i hope i hope you i hope the listeners really are enjoying this episode because i know i am so let's let's talk a little bit about your your background mm-hmm. what you know you you mentioned, uh, you know, you started from the real estate and everything. What advice would you give your younger self starting into this entrepreneurship role? Oh, my gosh, my younger self. Um, I would say you're going to have a great life. <laughs> there's there's <laughs> the advice I can give her. Like, you're going to have a great life. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to have a great yes. life. You know, I, I can't think of anything that I would have, you know, for me, when I was younger, I was I was 20, and unfortunately, my dad passed away, so 30 years ago. And at that point in time, it was a real turning point. I was young. I was at college. Um, he meant the world to me. And I think that was a twist and turn of events where I decided, I mean, now they call it YOLO, right? Mm. Like, I saw very quickly how somebody can die, and I thought, I'm going to live every day like it's my last. Mm. And I've lived like that ever since with my business, with my friends, with my life, with my family. Um, I don't say no to much. And I think 
I wonder, you know, you kind of look back, would I be where I am today doing what I do today if that had not happened? Mm, Or would I just have kept going in a really easy, really nice life that my parents gave me? Um, But I had to pivot and I had to learn to be on my own and I had to learn a lot of things quickly. And um, and I look back now and I'm I'm thankful for that 20 year old that was kind of deer in headlights at the time because I don't think I'd be here now. So I don't think I change much, believe it or not. I like, you know, I like that answer. In fact, I've asked this question almost every episode and I like when entrepreneurs say, you know, I think I wouldn't want to change anything because it what's what made me today. Right. right. Yeah. And it is. I mean, that seems so, you know, maybe cliche to say, but. There's not. I mean, sure, there's a lot of mistakes, you know. I mean, like you said, I mean, I've had a gazillion businesses. I mean, from the loan shark days to, (laughs) I mean, during the pandemic, I started a T-shirt business. I mean, you just, you do things. You get caught up in your own little world and creativity. And even if it makes you money or it doesn't make you money, it makes you happy. And it's fun. And I got my kids involved. And, you know, there are certain certain aspects to different things. So Yeah, and I would would totally challenge the guests listening, you know, be creative. Yeah. There is... I feel like there's this misconception when we're getting older to like, hey, grow up. Right. You know, right. no, no. Stay creative. Exactly. So get out there. Think of crazy thoughts. Put some fun videos together. Yep. Make a TikTok video. For exactly. You. Just don't ask me to make one. <laughs> I know. Me neither. I we talked about this earlier. <laughs> like, don't do, ask me. Don't ask me to nope. make a TikTok. Nope. Uh, yeah. You can ask me to be on your podcast. Yep. Don't ask me exactly. Me. Well, so. and I think a big thing, too, for me along the way is, you know, I'm a competitor. I have a drive. I have an ego, but I am not that like outside of myself that I can't make a fool of myself. And sometimes you really have to put yourself out there to be sometimes a small business owner. You have to be willing to put yourself out there. And sometimes people it's over the top and it's too much and this and that. But it's really sometimes our way of getting our business out there. And it's sometimes our way of our personalities coming out through our businesses as well. So it's yep. it's a little different. You won't sell it if you don't market it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No one's gonna there. know. That yeah. nobody's gonna know. Yeah. So when I say hustle, it really is. I know a lot of people don't like the term side hustle. Some yeah. people like it. Some people don't. I'm talking straight up hustle. I mean, yeah. I'm talking straight up. I was in sales. I was in hotel sales for a long time. That was my first real job. Like I was saying, Four Seasons. I worked for Merv Griffin Hotels, the um, talk show host back in the day. And, and it was constant hustle. I mean, yeah. here I am, 26, 27 years old, female, and I'm at the table with all white male 55 and overs. And they didn't know what to do with me. Like, <laughs> half the time, they're like, you, you reached your sales goals? I'm like, yep, I exceeded them. <laughs> Sorry, where's my trip? You know, they didn't. <laughs> They didn't know what to do with me. And, and, and it just, it kept going from there. Oh and I just God, knew great. I wanted more, you know? Yes. So now when you have all these books and all these things of, of, you know, leaning in and being in the table, it's like, I was, nobody yeah. just, no, back then nobody cared. Yeah. <laughs> I just did what I had to do. I had a sales job and I exceeded my limits. I remember one time they they took my bonus away because I had done too well. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, that guy didn't get his bonus taken away. Why did I get mine taken is, away? Because yeah. no one expected it from me, right? Like, no one expects this little loud mouth in the corner to go out and work <laughs> and actually get it done. Yeah, and it's not, like, to your point, you know, getting out there, networking is so important mm-hmm. to every business, you know, you're doing. Getting out there, talking to people, learning your industry, getting yes. your expertise. Even me, I'm still learning to this day, and I hope folks listening are, are learning something from this podcast as well. But with that said, what ad- what advice could you give to a younger entrepreneur oh you know it's it's funny my business now today is so different than 13 years ago um the way i did things but i think i think the basics are all the same i really do i mean for me i just you know found a need and and filled it yeah but you know i did my research i did my homework i found different ways you know i i don't wax eyebrows i am not i did not go to beauty school i did neither do i by the way yep yep see (laughs) see (laughs) <laughs> but one of the best books I ever read when I was younger was The E-Myth. So they oh, kind of dispelled, you know, people that are chefs, people that are hairdressers, people yeah. that are, you know, the craft. Yep. They can't run a business. That's why 80% of those businesses fail because they're so good at what they do, but they don't have the business side of it. So for me, I went out and researched the business side of it. I figured out everything you needed to do to own a waxing salon, be a waxing salon, all the things. And then I hired people to come in and be those people. Yeah. So I ran 95% of it. I still do. I have that. I have that business base. We succeeded for 13 years and through a pandemic. I don't, I can't actually do the craft, but yeah. I hire others to do it. 
So my advice would be go out there, follow your heart, follow your dreams, follow your passions. It might not be eyebrows. It might be, um, for me, I could get my kids off the bus at three o'clock in the afternoon because I work from mm, home. Yeah. That was my driving force. Yeah. You know, I always said it was the money. I was always like, oh my God, it's the money. I want to make more money, more money. And I had a business coach for years and he kept, he kept telling me like, no, that's not it. Go back, go back. And so every month we'd meet. And he's like, why are you doing this? I'm like, it's for the money. He's like, nope, <laughs> go back. And so finally one day I walked in, it was in his house and I walked in and I had my arms up and he looked at me and I looked at him and he's like, you found it. I said, freedom, freedom. And he's like, oh my God, there it is. It's not about the money anymore. I said, it's the freedom to pick up my kids after school. It's the freedom yeah. for me to wake up at six in the morning and start working on my business before the nine to five job started. Like it was the freedom that I got to do however I wanted to do my business, however I needed to to get it done, to have the freedoms that I wanted in my life yes. that were important to me. You know, and it's kind of funny, the, the episode that just came out, you know, for folks that are listening, you're going to realize how far in advance we record these things. Yep. But yep. today's, the today's coach, uh, today was actually a coaching episode. An okay. individual was a consultant and a coach, and he talked about, you know, having the business coach. And I talked about the importance of a business coach. Oh, and, and it's kind so of, important. Right? And, yes. and I'm speaking of which I don't have one, so I'll, we'll, we'll talk yep. more about yep. that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> And but but it it really is important to you know kind of be able to bounce those ideas off of you off of other people so they can kind of tell you hey what's working what's not working. But I'm actually reading a book right now. I'm not sure if you read it before or if anybody has before. Um, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I read it years ago. I'm reading it right now. Yep. And it's like the exact kind of conversation we're having. I'm like that. I would think that was in chapter one. Yep. Yep. <laughs> that's exactly like, it. It probably was. It was. It's great. And but that's. And for those that are interested, definitely go check it out. Rich Dad Poor Dad. It's it's pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of great books out there. Don't you know? Yeah. Read as much as you can. Oh, I've read you know. I've read everything. Like <laughs> read that as much is as you my can. crux. Yes, yes, I love it. But uh, it's 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 great. Um, so w with that said, you know, where where can the where can the folks find you? Where where oh are my you gosh. at on the social? Where can they find your business? Where if they need to get, if I need to get my brows done, yes. where am I going? I mean, start with the basics. Go to our website. I like it. Browbetty.com. Not uh, brow better. Not brow better. Brow okay. Betty. Don't, don't get confused. I like remember, I you're such a Betty. Don't be a Betty. <laughs> don't be a Betty. Don't be a Betty. <laughs> um, BrowBetty.com. And then from there, you'll see our locations. We've got one in Bridgeport, um, which is in the uh, Lake Oswego area, one in Progress Ridge, Beaverton area, and one in Happy Valley. Um, and then Instagram, Brow Betty. Facebook, Brow Betty. Um, LinkedIn, no Brow Betty. <laughs> you're not going to, you'll find me on there. I'm boring. You don't need to find me. I don't need a job today, so I'm good. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, you know, all over social media. Perfect. Yeah. You'll, you'll be able to find us and see our locations and, and, and see where we're at. So awesome. Jackie, thank you so much for being on the show. For those at home that are interested, please. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.